Well, good morning, Goshen. I trust that you are doing well. I do want you to know, as this pandemic continues, if there is anything that I can do for you, if there is any way that I can serve you, please do not hesitate to let me know. I want to be able to serve you in whatever way that I can. This morning we are in Esther chapter 8. I would encourage you to go ahead and get your Bible out and turn it to Esther chapter 8. We've got several of our members who are going to be reading the scripture for us this morning. And I want you to know that I am still looking for readers for next Sunday's sermon scripture. And so if you're interested in reading for me next week, please reach out to me and let me know. And I'll give you the passage that I would assign to you. And then you can read that and send me the video and we'll include it in next week's sermon video. But hear now the word of God from Esther chapter 8. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther sent Mordecai over to the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring, for an edict written in the name of the king, and sealed with the king's ring, cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the twenty-third day, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and um, sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters letters by Mount Carriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king was allowing, allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed fo force of any people or preference that may, might attack them, children or women included, and to plunder their goods. On one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa the Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown, and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was a gladness among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many of the peoples from the country declared themselves Jews, for the fear of the Jews had fallen on them. 
All right, thank you guys so much. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to consider it this morning. We pray that you would give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see. We pray that your spirit would be present with us, even now in our homes, that we would be transformed by the power of your gospel, by the power of your word, by the power of your spirit. Would you change us, make us more like Jesus? We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder if you have ever watched a movie where all of the major tension in the movie came to a resolution and it seemed like the movie should have ended at that point. The problem was that the movie continued on for about 30 more minutes. It's usually in those times that I look at Ashley and I say, I mean, this movie could have been over 30 minutes ago. Ashley loves movies. It's not really my favorite thing, but I watch movies because I love Ashley and she loves movies. But really a major pet peeve of mine when it comes to movies is when the movie should have been over much earlier than it actually was. Well, last week we looked at Esther chapter 7 and we saw how Haman, the Agagite, who had made an evil plan against Mordecai and the Jews, was hanged. And you may have thought, well, that seems like the end of the story. Isn't isn't it all over now? Shouldn't this be the end now that Haman is dead? Well, not so fast. There are still some things that need to be resolved. And so as we look at Esther chapter 8, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three groups who are still in need of resolution as this narrative continues over these last few chapters. Three groups who are still in need of resolution. And so Haman, he is, his resolution has been received, he's dead, he's been hanged. But the question, that raises the question, what about Esther and Mordecai? What about Esther and Mordecai? And what we find as we look at verse 1 is that King Ahasuerus, gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman. You see, according to ancient historians, whenever a traitor was executed, the king would take control of his property. And so in this case, King Ahasuerus took control of Haman's property, and then he gave it to Esther. Perhaps this was simply an act of generosity because Ahasuerus loved Esther, and so he wanted to do something nice for her. Or maybe it was Ahasuerus trying to make things right between him and Esther because he knew that he had messed up by allowing this decree against Mordecai and the Jews. Kind of like a husband sometimes buys flowers for his wife when he's trying to smooth things over. He knows that he's done something wrong and he wants to get back in his wife's good graces. But whatever the motivation on the part of Ahasuerus, Esther wasn't done. In fact, she brought her cousin Mordecai in before the king so that she could uh, introduce him now as her cousin uh, to her husband Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus at that point, the Bible tells us, removed his signet ring, which he had previously given to Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. This essentially elevated Mordecai to second in command in the empire. This was the very position that Haman had held before. And perhaps you could say it was the very position that Ahasuerus should have given to Mordecai back when Mordecai saved his life by telling him about the plot that had been made against him. And so Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. As we think about this, what a tremendous reversal this was for Mordecai. I mean, you think about Mordecai and you think about all that has transpired here in the book of Esther with him. You remember he was forgotten after he saved the king's life. Then there was this evil plot against him. Haman had it out for him. He wanted him hanged on the gallows. But then he was honored by the king. What he had done for the king was remembered and Ahasuerus honored him. And now, all of a sudden, Mordecai has been elevated to this position of second in command in the empire. You'll notice this was also an elevation for Esther. 
Because previously, even though she was the queen, she had been kind of relegated to the harem and there, she couldn't come in to the king unless the king called for her. But now, she had full access to her husband, the king. And in this, I think there must have been a tremendous temptation for Esther and Mordecai. I mean, they had everything at this point that they could have wanted. Haman's position and his possessions had been given to Mordecai. Esther was safe in the palace with Ahasuerus, her husband, the king. And after seeing what had happened to Haman, there was no chance that anyone was going to mess with either Mordecai or Esther. But this raises another question for us, doesn't it? Not only what about Mordecai and Esther, but what about the Jews? What about the Jews? You see, Haman was dead, but the decree that had been issued in the name of the king for the annihilation of the Jews was still in place. And time was ticking. If nothing was done on the 13th day of the 12th month, when that day arrived, all of the Jews would be destroyed, young and old women and children, everyone. And so what did Esther do? How did Esther respond to this situation? Did she return to the queen's quarters, believing that since she had saved Mordecai, she had accomplished her goal? Did she just reason that there was nothing more that she could do to help her people, the Jews? No, not at all. In fact, we see Esther's courage in verse 3. The Bible says, Then Esther spoke again to the king, she fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. What did Esther do? She fell at the king's feet and she made her plea to the king. The king heard her plea, we see in verse 4, and he extended to her his golden scepter. And then look at what Esther said in verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, Esther says, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if this thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Notice as you look at that how Esther prefaces her request. And the preface is really in four parts. You see Esther first says, if it please the king. She then says, if I have found favor in his sight. And if the thing seems right before the king. And I am pleasing in his eyes. Now think about that. What do you notice about this preface to Esther's request? It's all about Ahasuerus, isn't it? It's all about how Ahasuerus views Esther. Ahasuerus isn't concerned with right and wrong. Ahasuerus isn't concerned with justice and injustice. He doesn't care about the Jews. And Esther knows that. She knows that's how he feels. And so she makes her request accordingly. She appeals to him on the basis of what she knows might actually get through to him. She appeals to his self-interest. And she basically says, if you really love me, you'll give me my request. If you really love me, you will provide for the deliverance of my people. Now, Hesra, he still doesn't understand what the big deal is. I mean, I've done all these things for Mordecai. I've done all these things for you. I mean, what more do you want? I've given you the house of Haman. I've had Haman hanged on the gallows. I mean, what more could you ask for? But even though he doesn't understand what Mordecai and Esther are after, he does give Mordecai the authority to issue a decree in his name on behalf of the Jews. Now, I want you to notice what is going on here with Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is a terrible leader. I mean, even though Haman was behind it, Ahasuerus, it was his decree. The first decree against the Jews was Ahasuerus' decree. 
but he's not about to take any responsibility for it. He's not about to say, yeah, you know what, I was, I was wrong. I shouldn't have allowed that to happen. And friends, I want you to understand that good leaders take responsibility for their actions. They don't pass the buck. But not only does Ahasuerus take no responsibility for his first edict, he's not even willing to lift one finger to do anything to help protect the Jews. He tells Mordecai, if you want it done, you do it. And again, good leaders aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. Good leaders aren't afraid to roll up their sleeves and get to work fixing a problem whether they created it or not. But here in Esther 8, Ahasuerus, he's the one responsible for the problem and even still, he's not willing to do anything to correct the problem. And on top of that, He's making again the exact same mistake that he made before. You remember before he gave Haman the full authority to issue this decree, this decree against the Jews. If he had paid a little bit more attention, if he had kind of kept his eye on things and known exactly what was going on, and instead of just giving Haman all the authority to do something in his name, maybe the plan could have been averted in the first place. But here they are and... Again, Ahasuerus is more than willing to give Mordecai all of the authority to issue a decree in his name without ever having looked at it. And friends, I want you to know good leaders don't micromanage, but neither do they turn a blind eye to the things that are going on and being done under their leadership. If you haven't picked up on it yet, I want you to know that Ahasuerus was not a good dude. He was a terrible king. And his poor leadership had disastrous results for the people who were under his authority. Of course, the only redeeming factor here for Ahasuerus is that Mordecai is not the power-hungry, evil, egomaniac that Haman was. He doesn't use his power and authority for his own good. He uses it for the people in the empire, the Jews. Rather, Mordecai's position of power and influence, it was, it was good news for the Jews that Mordecai was in this position of power. Now we're asking the question, what about the Jews? And we haven't fully answered it yet, but it's closely wed to the final question that I want to ask. What about the enemies of the Jews? So not just what about Mordecai and Esther, not just what about the Jews, but what about the enemies of the Jews? If you read the second half of the chapter, you'll see that Mordecai's decree gave the Jews the authority to defend themselves against their enemies. The king's first decree commanding the annihilation of the Jews was irrevocable. It couldn't be undone. There was no way to go back and change it. The only thing that could be done now was to issue a, another decree that would allow the Jews to defend themselves. And so that's exactly what Mordecai did. He issued this second decree allowing the Jews to defend themselves against their enemies. And if you look at the second half of Esther 8, you'll see that this created a lot of rejoicing among the Jews. And you can understand why. I mean, perhaps you understand their response back in chapter 4 when they first got word of Haman's decree. You remember there was great mourning among the Jews. They were fasting and weeping and lamenting. They, they were even, some of them were in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, it was a terrible thing. They just knew that they were going to be wiped out, that this was the end for them. But now they're rejoicing. Interestingly enough, they haven't even been delivered yet. They've just been given permission to defend themselves. But the difference is that now they have hope. And Goshen and Dad, I don't want you to miss the power of hope. As we're in the midst of this global pandemic, we don't know all that lies ahead before us. But there is one thing that we do know. That our God is on His throne in heaven. That He is in control of all things. And our hope is firmly rooted, not in our circumstances, but rather in the Lord. The interesting thing about the Jews rejoicing here is that there's no indication in the text that their joy was directed toward God. 
Just as there was no mention in the midst of their weeping and lamenting back in chapter 4 that they were doing that uh, and that they were bringing their request to God. There's no mention of, of God there. And the same is often true of us, isn't it? I mean, when things are going poorly, we might mourn and lament, but do we fail to turn to the Lord? Do we fail to bring our cry, our lament to the Lord? And then when things are going well in our lives, when there's rejoicing in our hearts, do we bring that rejoicing to the Lord? We forget that it is only because of the good and sovereign hand of our God that we are where we are. And so in the bad times, may we learn to look to our God. And in the good times, may we learn to look to our God. We'll have to wait until next week to see the rest of what happens with the Jews and their enemies. But there are a couple of things that I want to draw your attention to as we come to a close. The first thing that I want you to see is the way that God has preserved His people throughout the book of Esther. We've been pointing out time after time how God is in control, but you'll remember that the, the name God is not mentioned even one time in the book of Esther. But as we look at this book, what we find is that his fingerprints are all over the place. That no, though his name is not mentioned, he is active, he is present, he is accomplishing his purposes for the good of his people. King Ahasuerus may have been absent in the preservation of the Jews, but understand that God was present and active and in control all along. Recently, in regards to the coronavirus, Governor Cuomo in New York said this, the number is down because we brought the number down. God did not do that. Faith did not do that. Destiny did not do that. A lot of pain and suffering did that. He went on to say, that's how it works, it's math. And if you don't continue to do that, you're going to see that number go back up. And that will be a tragedy if that number goes back up. Now, obviously, his overall point was about the importance of social distancing. And I agree with the governor on that. It's the very reason why I'm speaking to you via video this morning rather than in person. Social distancing is important if we're going to slow the spread of the coronavirus. But as Christians who know our Bibles, as followers of Jesus who have been studying the book of Esther, we know that our God is sovereign over all things, including COVID-19. And so, yes, we social distance. We don't believe that our faith in Jesus will prevent us from contracting the coronavirus. We don't believe that the blood of Jesus is some kind of disinfectant that's going to cleanse us from COVID-19. But we do cry out to our God in prayer, knowing that He is all-powerful, knowing that He is a good God, knowing that He is sovereign over all things, and that He is able to bring an end to this virus and make it possible for us to begin gathering together again as the people of God. Finally, I want you to see how Esther points us to Jesus. The Jews in the story of Esther, they were helpless to save themselves. An edict had been sent out by the king. They were to be put to death. There was nothing that they could do about it. What they needed was someone to go to the king on their behalf. They needed someone who would put aside personal interests. They needed someone who would set aside his or her own safety. They needed someone who was willing to risk dignity, honor, and even life itself. And for the Jews in Persia, Esther was that someone. She set aside her own interests for the sake of her people. And she boldly approached the throne of the king to attain salvation for her people. And I want you to know, Goshen, that an edict has been sent out decreeing our death as well. Not because of our ethnicity, but because of our sinfulness. That edict is found in Romans 
It says that for the wages of sin is death. That what you deserve and what I deserve because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, is we deserve death. We deserve separation from God, our Creator, forever. But another one has come. One like Esther who set aside his own interests, who set aside his own safety. He gave up his dignity. He gave up his honor. He even gave up his life. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Philippians 2, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The Lord Jesus, he came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. And he went to the cross to die, to pay for your sin and for mine. In some ways, Esther is an example to us. I think about her courage. I think about her commitment to her people. I think about her commitment to doing what was just and to seek justice on behalf of her people, even though the consequences could have been great. But most of all, even more than an example, she points us to Jesus. She reminds us of the Savior who came and gave His life for us. That if we would turn from our sin and place our trust in Jesus, we can be brought into a right relationship with God, our Creator. We have an advocate with God the Father. Just as Esther was an advocate for the Jews, Jesus is our advocate with God the Father. He goes to the Father. He pleads with the Father on our behalf. He's made sacrifice for our sin. And what a joy it is to know that we have this hope because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He accomplished on Calvary's cross. I want you to know that if you're watching this video this morning and you've never turned from your sin, you've never placed your trust in Jesus, you've never found this hope, you've never found this salvation, I want you to know that if today you would turn from your sin, if today you would place your trust in Jesus, you can be brought into a right relationship with God, your Creator. It's not too late for you. Just bow your head, even now, right now, and confess your sin to God and ask Him to save you by the blood of His Son, Jesus. If you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus, I'd love to have that opportunity to share with you. You can contact me through our church website at GoshenBaptistChurch.net. You can contact me through our Facebook page. Or you can email me at PastorAdamBlosser at gmail.com. I'd love to be able to connect with you about what it means to follow Jesus. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, as you think about the Esther story, May you think about the advocate that we have with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we, with boldness, bring our requests to Him, knowing that He hears our prayers, He answers our prayers, because of what Jesus accomplished on Calvary's cross for us. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. We pray that You would change us because of it. Father, that your spirit would work in our hearts, that you would conform us more and more to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Change us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.